How, how are, are you? you? <laughs> Kelly, how are you? Doing well. Uh, we are going to start here in just a moment. Mm. Letting a few people in. And um, for everyone who is on right now, this will be recorded. So um, we do ask you to keep your mics off, but we'll go through all of that in the introductions. So I'm going to start recording and pass it off to ONC for the night. Hello, everyone. Welcome to In the Know with Ro. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm Olivia Speckman, and I'll be moderating tonight's event. I'm so excited to be involved with this event tonight, which hope you all learn to do citizen science. Test. I grew up in Indianapolis and have so many wonderful memories of going on walks with my grandmother along the canal and the White River. While we were walking, we would observe and try to identify plants and animals. We didn't know it at the time, but we were doing citizen science. These walks along the waterways had such an impact on me. And as a new mom, it's one of the things I'm looking forward to doing with my own daughter. My interest in waterways led me to the work I do today. As a scientist with V3 companies, I get to work on projects involving our local waterways. I also engage with our waterways through my volunteer work with RO. As an ecology committee member since 2018, I've had the opportunity to work on great initiatives and events like the one we have prepared for you all this evening. This evening, you will hear from several experts and learn about biodiversity and how to use the iNaturalist app to identify species and prepare you all for the City Nature Challenge. Kelly Brown, Rose Metric and Programs Manager, is going to kick things off for us by giving you all an introduction to Roe. Kelly was born and raised in Kentucky, where she fell in love with nature on the family farm and received a wildlife conservation degree from Murray State University. She came to Indiana to get her master's from Indiana University School of Public Environmental Affairs. Then Ray Schnapp, the Director of Conservation for the Indiana Forest Alliance, will be talking with you all about the importance of biodiversity. Next, we have Brittany Davis Swinford, the Regional Park Manager at Eagle Creek Park, who will be teaching you all how to use the iNaturalist app. Brittany started in parks as an interpretive naturalist before becoming a park manager and has been in the parks and rec field for 18 years. Brittany absolutely loves to do citizen science and participates in as many bio blitzes, bird counts, and plant inventories as she can. She has also been one of the City Nature Challenge winners for the past three years for most species and most identifications. Brittany is also the co-chair of Rose Education Committee. Jacob Brinkman will be our final speaker today. Jacob is an ecologist with the Indianapolis Office of Land Stewardship. He has 17 years of experience in the environmental field, including natural resource management, restoration, education, and consulting. Jacob received a Bachelor of Science in Public Affairs from Indiana University in 2004 with a major in Environmental Management. He also has a professional certifi certificate in Watershed Management from Purdue University and works to promote conservation and stewardship of Indy's natural areas. So before we get started, we just have a few housekeeping items to take care of. Um, your microphones have been muted and we ask that you remain muted throughout the presentation. We do encourage you all to participate by submitting questions in the chat located at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be addressed after each speaker and with a general Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll also be sharing links and resources with you all in the chat. Tonight's presentation is being recorded and the recording will be available on Rose website for future reference. And now I'm gonna kick things over to Kelly to get us introduced to Rose. might help if I unmute myself. <laughs> well, we're so happy to have you guys all here. And uh, one of the first things I want to do is share the poll results. So as you guys all came in, we asked you, uh, which waterway uh, do you live closest to or feel most connected to? And the top one was Fall Creek with 30%. Uh, and then there was a pretty close tie between Eagle Creek, Pogues Run, and the White River. Um, I should have also selected Pleasure Run because that's where I live close by. We're really happy to have you guys all here. And hopefully, are you seeing a PowerPoint presentation? Oh, it didn't stop, did it? There we go. <laughs> so uh, probably a lot of you know what Row is, but Row is a collective impact initiative. And our mission is um, to convene and support community partners to enhance quality of life, invest in innovation, 
analysis and cultural advancements and environmental quality along Indies waterways and adjacent neighborhoods. Um, if you're not familiar with what a collective impact is, um, this diagram kind of tries to help uh, show that very complex idea. So um, really it's a bunch of collective organizations, people, governments, um, nonprofits, all coming together for a common agenda. And we work together kind of like somebody rowing a boat might. We have um, a backbone support, so that's the staff, that's myself, Julie, and Andrea, who are all on today. Um, we have our element committees, which like Brittany is a co-chair of one, our steering committee, which is similar to a board of directors. And then we have the, uh, the waterways themselves. And that's where a lot of the community work happens and the on the grounds um, activity happens, which is really the foundation of Roe. So we operate in six waterways. Uh, we, you also saw those in the poll today. So hopefully you're pretty familiar with them. And this is where they are geographically in Indianapolis. Um, one of the best ways to get involved in Roe is to join a waterway committee. So we lead through the community. Uh, those committees meet monthly. And if you want to learn more, uh, we'll, have, we'll post uh, a link to our website so you can see those upcoming meetings. Um, they also help create work plans so that they're really focused on what they're achieving and identify opportunities in their communities. And it really helps, Roe helps connect resources directly to those waterways and those communities. So oh, without further ado, I am going to pass it off to our next presenter, Ray, so you guys can learn about biodiversity. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ray Schnapp. I'm with the Indiana Forest Alliance. Um, the Indiana Forest Alliance has been doing a series of um, eco-blitz surveys, their taxonomic surveys in uh, Morgan Monroe and Yellowwood State Forest, and also in the Hoosier National Forest. We are documenting the number of species that are present in these areas to try to form a sort of baseline of um, what's out there. And really, um, in the last three years, we've documented more than 3,000 species in a 900-acre tract of, of um, native forest. And um, this is really exciting and, um, and fun and also hard work. And there are opportunities for volunteers. We'll, we'll hear more about that later if you're interested. But uh, people are often asking me about the biodiversity of our forest in Indiana. And so I wanted to um, just kind of introduce that idea. So biodiversity is the variety of life in a particular area. And um, it's often described as species richness, which is the number of species in an area, in a given area. But um, biodiversity is not just about numbers. And I wanna, I wanna talk about that a little bit more. Um, we have been hearing a lot lately about a decline in biodiversity. There have been some really uh, kind of scary headlines uh, about the insect apocalypse um, and um, the loss of biodiversity in our coral reefs and, and so forth. So um, one question that arises is like, why should we care? Well, I think it's really important to recognize that we humans are not separate from the environment. Our survival is interdependent um, with other species. And um, um, th these uh, species play an important role in, in our future too. So uh, like, for example, plants are the foundation of the food chain. They capture solar energy and convert it into food that animals can eat. And um, th they build our topsoil and hold the topsoil in place. They prevent floods. So plants are really important for us. Um, animals are in turn eating the plants and recycling nutrients into the soil to support future plant growth. And um, one factor that we humans have is that we've created this huge kind of urban suburban matrix that's not very diverse. Um, in fact, it's mostly grass and lawns and maybe also some um, shrubs and things that are imported from far away places that are not native. So some of the solutions to our declining biodiversity are uh, to educate ourselves. And I think that's part of the purpose of why we're, we're, why we're here tonight and um, to develop a better understanding of the species that we're interdependent with. And um, I think it's just really important to recognize that biodiversity is not only about the numbers. Some species are um, very adaptable and opportunistic and even invasive. 
while others are native and very specialized in their needs. And uh, so for instance, in our work in the um, interior forest, some species are really dependent on that interior forest habitat. And um, then they can't adapt to disturbance very well. So um, while we're going through this training tonight, I, I know we're going to hear more about um, different types of species and sort of the niche, niches in uh, the ecosystem that they occupy. Um, so I'll just stop there and um, we can move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Ray. Um, I don't think I saw any questions come in just yet. So I believe that means we're ready for uh, Brittany. Excellent. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Let's get this ready right here. Okay. <laughs> so you have registered for the citizen science program. Uh, so we're assuming you already know what citizen science is. It's actually a pretty popular term, uh, the Webster or Oxford Dictionary coined the definition in 2014, and it continues to grow in popularity. So citizen science is collection of data uh, done by the general public and usually a collaborative project with professional scientists. Uh, so we're excited to get as many people involved in citizen science as we can. Uh, Citizen science is using crowdsourcing. Uh, so I'm gonna do a demonstration on how to use the iNaturalist application. So uh, that is obtaining information from a large number of people and then also checking that information. Uh, so we will go through that in just a moment. Uh, citizen science has actually been around forever. So the term is fairly new, uh, like I said, but one of the original Smithsonian, uh, one of the original citizen science projects was about the periodic cicada, which this is the year for our 17 year periodic cicada. And how do, how do we know that it's 17 years? Uh, we know that because of citizen science. Uh, so someone observed, you know, hey, these cicadas are emerging, it's crazy. And so people would take notes and uh, give their geographic location. So that's one of the earliest citizen science projects uh, that we know of. And then another early one was the Audubon Christmas bird count. Uh, so I had to throw that in there. I love doing the Christmas bird count. Uh, believe it or not, the first Christmas bird count uh, instead of going with binoculars and viewing the birds, people would actually shoot the birds. Uh, so that's how you would count your birds. You would shoot the bird and then bring it in and uh, the ladies would use the feathers to adorn their caps. Uh, fortunately, <laughs> someone put an end to that. So now we're taking photos instead of shooting the birds. And uh, so when we uh, talk about the uh, city nature challenge and we say, hey, you know, how many species can you take? please don't take them, just take a photo of them. <laughs> uh, so we're here tonight to promote the City Nature Challenge, which is a really exciting collaboration. Uh, the City Nature Challenge began in 2016 in California and was sort of a, a competition between LA and San Francisco to see who could log uh, the highest number of uh, species found in nature. And it has since grown, and now it is a worldwide uh, project, the City Nature Challenge. Uh, so we are doing the City Nature Challenge focused in Indianapolis, in the greater Indianapolis area. This project is extremely important uh, because it allows us to create a baseline of what is living, uh, so to track biodiversity. So we want to track everything that um, is living, sometimes non-living. We may um, also track uh, some geology or soil types. Uh, so just really exciting. And it's important when you do a citizen science project that you continue on um, because we will have that baseline data. So this is a snapshot in time of what we are seeing. Um, it will also uh, teach us about phenology. Uh, so what are you seeing at this certain time? 
So it's important when you do one of these projects that you select the same week or the same time every single year. I'm really glad uh, that this takes place in April because there is so much to see out in the woods uh, with spring. Everything is blooming and the insects are waking up. So it's just a really exciting time of the year. And this project gives me an excuse to get outdoors. Uh, with the City Nature Challenge, um, all you'll need to do is download the iNaturalist app, which is a free app, and I will show you uh, how, to, how to use the app. Uh, but once you download the app, you're just going to make observations, uh, but you can also do identifications, and we will show you that. And if you're competitive, there are some prizes available for you as well. So the City Nature Challenge actually incorporates the greater Indianapolis area, so all of the uh, yellow counties would be included in that. And that's okay, because if you think of Los Angeles, California, <laughs> uh, that size is, is quite large as well. Uh, so it has grown a little bit to include the donut counties. With Roe reconnecting to our waterways, we are doing a little backyard bio blitz at the same time. So our indie backyard bio blitz is a little branch of the city nature challenge. Uh, so we have also created an iNaturalist project that will collect your observations during the city nature challenge. And for our collection, it will only be uh, Marion County right here. So this will give us uh, some additional information of what is being seen in Marion County and what is being seen in these donut counties. So, um, in my mind, it's hard to compete with Brown County, uh, Nashville, Indiana, where I'm from, but we'll see what we can do, see what we can find. Uh, so we have a short video we'd like to play for you. And let me stop sharing. I just submitted a photo of cutleaf toothwort through the iNaturalist app for the 2021 Socially Distant City Nature Challenge, where you and your friends being outside all day can also be part of science. It's also a competition. If you're really into the competitive spirit, you can collect as many species as you can find and make as many observations as you can. I hope you'll join us April 30th through May 3rd. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen, for the wonderful video, and Angela. And I'm going to go back to my screen. Okay. <laughs> uh, so now to dive into iNaturalist. So again, it is a free app. All you have to do is download the free app on your iPhone or on your Android, create a login, um, and create a password and then you'll always have it. Uh, they even have family sharing on this application where up to six family members can share the same iNaturalist account if you want to. Uh, so iNaturalist has become so popular, over 13 million observations were recorded in 2020 and this continues to grow. Uh, with the City Nature Challenge, there are uh, different apps that you can use. Uh, but Indiana has selected the iNaturalist, which I am a huge fan of, of iNaturalist. I've got um, 1,900 observations on my own account and can't wait to you exceed over 2,000. So now I'm going to stop sharing um, my computer screen and hop on my mobile phone. So you can download iNaturalist on your desktop, you can use that application or you can do the mobile application. I prefer to do the mobile application because that's what I use to take all my photos is my cell phone. So I will hop right over here. Excuse me while you look at my forehead for a while. <laughs> there we go. Okay, now you're seeing my cell phone. See. Okay, let's try that again. It worked during practice, right? 
it did work during practice, so we will get this going. Uh, and feel free to pull out your phone and follow along if you like, if you have iNaturalist downloaded or download it right now. Yes. Okay, there we go. I, I have a feeling it's going to work. Okay. There we go. So I already have uh, the iNaturalist app downloaded. And so today I took some photos of spring wildflowers that were in bloom. And so I'm going to walk you through how to make an observation. Um, so as you look down on my screen, I have quite a few, but I'm going to select the observe button right here. And I have a couple options. I could activate the camera on my phone right now, or I can select a photo that I've already taken, and I have already taken some. So I'm going to go ahead and go to camera roll. And here are my most recent photos that I took today. And I want to know what this white flower is and the huge leaf. So right here, I'm going to select this flower. And that's a great photo of the flower, but it doesn't really show the foliage of the leaf. So I'm going to go ahead and select that as well. And now I'm going to hit done on the bottom. And so it gives me my photos to preview. And that looks pretty good to me. I could see the flower parts. I could see the leaves. So I'm going to go ahead and hit next on my phone. And now it's asking me, what did I see? Well, I know that this is a mayapple flower. Um, but I want to show you how to figure that out. If I don't know what it is, I could go ahead and just hit share at the bottom. And then it would pop up as an unknown. Um, but I want to see what iNaturalist thinks that it is. So it has artificial intelligence. And it is pretty smart um, because there are those you know, 13 million observations. So I'm going to go ahead and hit, what did you see? And let iNaturalist suggest an identification. Uh, so there we go. And I'm going to select Mayapple. And if I want to learn some more information about Mayapple and make sure that Mayapple is native uh, to Indiana and seen in my area, I'm going to hit on the information button. And it gives me a couple photos. It gives me the history of Mayapple. So it used to be called American Mandrake and Ground Lemon. Uh, I'm going to scroll through. Yes, that definitely is my plant. So there's a picture of what the fruit looks like. So you can learn quite a bit as you're scrolling through with the iNaturalist. So that looks good to me. I'm going to go ahead and select Mayapple. And then uh, the app has populated the date and the time that this photo was taken and the location. Uh, so when you are logging into iNaturalist, you can select if you want your photos geotagged or if you don't. Uh, so if you want more privacy on where you find things, uh, you can select not to geotag and actually select from a map. I love to geotag because the following year I know where to find something and I know the date. Uh, there's also an option to select the geo privacy down here. Uh, for geo privacy, I select that if I am uh, recording a species that is rare, endangered, threatened, or maybe it's my morel mushroom best hunting site. Uh, I'm going to hit geo privacy so you can't find the uh, Latin long of my site. But for this Mayapple, those are pretty much everywhere. So I'm going to go ahead and hit share for that. So now it has um, uploaded my A apple, my May apple with my other observations. And I'm going to go ahead and take you through one more observation. Well, that's downloading. So let's see. I'm going to select this really cool looking flower uh, that I saw earlier. So I'm selecting my photos. And then I hit done. And uh, so there they are. So those are the flowers. And I also have the stem and the leaves. And my photo is actually better than what it shows. but. You can take my word for it. Uh, so now I'm going to hit next and see um, if iNaturalist can recognize and identify what I have seen. 
And it has. So yes, that's the Eastern Shooting Star Wildflower. So I'm going to select that. And then uh, I'm going to select a project. So with iNaturalist, there are lots of projects. And the project we're talking about right tonight is the Indy City Nature Challenge. So I'm going to select project. And these are the projects that I am a member of. Uh, so I've done the City Nature Challenge. This will be my fourth year doing that. Um, this project is not open yet. Uh, so that won't open uh, for a couple days. So I'm going to go ahead and select reconnecting to our waterways. I'll select that. So now I've got my project and now I can just hit share. Very good. Uh, so that is uploading. So when you're doing iNaturalist, you, this is called making an observation. Uh, so I have observed something, I'm going to go ahead and throw in an ID, uh, but you can also confirm identification. So that's a fun part of the City Nature Challenge is hundreds of people are uploading observations and you can confirm their identification. So now I'm going into activity and 34 seconds ago, uh, someone suggested an ID on my orchid that I posted, my showy orchis. So I'm gonna select on that. And now I can see that someone else agrees with me. Uh, so they are confirming my identification that that was a showy orchis. And once I have two confirmations, uh, then your observation is considered research grade uh, for iNaturalist. So this is a great tool uh, for us to log what we are seeing, uh, but also for you to find other things. So this is a free research uh, tool for anyone to use. So anyone can log in and find that. So really great. I'm going to go ahead and move out of that. And let's see what other projects. So the City Nature Challenge, you can go ahead and join the project on your iNaturalist account. But even if you don't select this project, uh, this project is set up as a collection project where it will collect all of your uh, observations for that geographic range in those dates. So uh, Rufus was good and he's not allowing any observations yet until it officially starts. So we appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen for a moment. Okay. <laughs> and now we have some short videos uh, that will show us how to take a good nature photo. So we're going to go ahead and load those up for you. I found this really cool mushroom. I think I know what kind it is, but I'm not exactly sure. So I'm going to go ahead and try it out on iNaturalist. So when I'm taking a picture of this, I'm going to take a photo of the top of it. Ooh, listen to that. That's cool. And then I'm also going to take a picture of the underside of it. So with mushrooms, mushrooms are either porous, like little tiny breathing holes, or they have gills, uh, like fish gills. So I'm going to try to do that. And the easiest way for me is I'm going to put it on selfie mode, just like I'm going to take my own photo. And then I'm going to put my camera right there. And so now I can see the underside of this mushroom, and it is porous. So this is a polypore shelf fungus, and I think this one's called, is called artist conch, or artist polypore. Yep, there we go. And now I'm just going to upload it to iNaturalist. And there it is. iNaturalist is calling it artist bracket, Ganoderna aplanatum. Very cool.
don't always have to see the animal in order to make an observation. You can record its call, you can record tracks it leaves, or a great example right here is a stump that a beaver's eaten. You can tell that a beaver ate this stump because you can see some claw marks in here and the general shape that it was cut with a stump. It's a great example of beaver presence and you don't even need to see a beaver to make the observation. It looks like a deer's been through this area. Even though I haven't seen the deer yet, I could definitely take a picture of this and submit it to iNaturalist for the City Nature Challenge. Okay, uh, thanks Kelly for showing us the videos and Julie has put links to all the videos uh, right in the chat. And thank you Rufus from Indiana Sciences for uploading our videos onto your YouTube channel. So we have a collection, I believe of eight, eight different videos. Uh, so feel free to check those out. And if you have questions about iNaturalist, uh, I'm gonna stick around and answer those for you. So now I'm going to pass it off to Jacob Brinkman. Good evening, everyone, and uh, I am an ecologist with the Indianapolis Office of Land Stewardship, and I also co-chair the Roe Ecology Committee, and we're going to discuss some supplemental materials that you can use for the backyard bio blitz. So I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully everybody can see that. So if you do not have a backyard or very much yard to survey, you are certainly welcome to visit your neighborhood park or a nearby green space to record your observations. Uh, and Sorry, Jacob, will you put it in presentation mode? Just click new share. Uh, no, all you have to do is click the um, present button on your PowerPoint. I don't know why it's not. It's under view, I think. Uh, oh, and you might There's have to. Show. Yeah, the slideshow view. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. Can you see the slide? I see you're getting ready to present. It could have frozen, so you might want to stop sharing and then just reshare real fast. Occasionally. Okay. Let happens. me try that. Sorry yeah. about that. Occasionally that happens. You don't see that? I'm seeing the back end still. Okay, I'm gonna try. Uh, but I see your mouse, so just hit yeah the present mode. Yeah, that's not an option on here, unfortunately. I uh, if you go all the way down to the very bottom of the screen where you zoom in and out, and then hit the button right beside it. That button, hit that. Yeah. Bear with me. I apologize. Does that make a difference? Yes, there you go, you're good. Okay, you're good. wonderful. So if you do not have a larger yard or you wanna visit a nearby park or green space, you're certainly welcome to do that to record your observations. And I have some links on this slide where you can find uh, all the Indy Parks properties. There's over 200 Indy Parks um, and that comprises over 11,000 acres. So there's gotta be a place nearby where you live if you want to try to find uh, a different place to survey. And if you're interested in higher quality habitats, uh, these this is a map of uh, properties that land stewardship manages, and these are going to be higher quality natural areas, including Eagle Creek Park, Holiday Park, Southeast Way, Southwest Way. Um, so uh, if you haven't been to one of those parks or it's near the part of town where you live, then I encourage you to get out and visit one of these locations. You're going to uh, likely find a greater diversity of plants and wildlife in one of these locations. 
And if you do not have access to iNaturalist or are looking for a more family-friendly way to participate in the Backyard BioBlitz, you can play a round of Backyard BioBlitz Bingo. And um, the purpose is just to get outside and discover all the diversity in nature. And we'll make sure to share a copy of this document at the end of the event, or you can uh, print it. And uh, there's also a fillable PDF document that you might be able to use from your mobile device. And uh, it's just like any other bingo, you would uh, mark your observations on the card with a coin or bean until an entire row is filled, uh, vertical, horizontal, or diagonal. And... I have to mention invasive species just because this is a core part of our work in restoration and managing our local natural habitats. But a lot of these plants are sold in the ornamental trade and the nursery trade. So uh, they may already be in your yard. Uh, the most common and widespread invasive species that we have here in Indianapolis include bush honeysuckle, winter creeper, calorie pear, burning bush, and uh, a lot of those birds eat the fruit and then disperse the seed in their droppings. So they show up and invade our nearby natural areas and parks. And we commit a lot of resources to controlling and removing these. So if you have them in your yard, try to identify them first. And um, we can obviously help with any technical assistance. Um, if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. Julie can put that in the chat. Uh, but then come up with a plan to phase these invasives out of your yard. And I recommend native plants as alternatives. And that includes all kinds of trees, shrubs, and wildflowers that um, can work for any sun and soil conditions you have at home. And of course, I'm still kind of of the old school philosophy where I like to use field guides and it uh, doesn't have to replace iNaturalist. It, this is a good supplement to all of that. And um, I'm going to stop sharing now, just momentarily. Can you see the field guide that I have here? Okay, so uh, I have some Peterson's field guides that I like to use. This is one on birds. I have another Peterson's field guide to eastern forests. Of course, here in Indiana, we're in the eastern deciduous hardwood forest. So make sure you have an appropriate guide uh, for local wildlife and plants. And uh, this is a great local um, field guide. This is Wildflowers of Holiday Park by Norma Wallman, and there's really wonderful photos inside of there and great information about a lot of our native wildflowers, especially spring ephemerals, which are all over right now in bloom. This is uh, Marion Jackson's 101 Trees of Indiana. This is a great field guide for trees and shrubs. And then Kayat Skevich's uh, Indiana Wildflowers. I was lucky enough to go on a wildflower foray with her in Bloomington when I was still in college. And she, she is such a source of knowledge about all native plants in Indiana. So if you haven't picked up a copy, uh, you might be able to borrow this from your library as well. And then this is getting into like the real uh, nitty gritty kind of detail work. This is uh, Heather Holmes, Pollinators of Native Plants. And this is like an essential resource and you know, restoration ecology for um, choosing native plants that are going to support the greatest you know, biodiversity uh, with an, a focus on pollinators. So bees, butterflies, and moths. So if you have any questions about those books, you can ask me. And um, there are also some other local resources that I would recommend you get in touch with. Um, the Indiana, Indiana Native Plant Society. Can you see this again? Okay. And then uh, Roe also has a residential invasive species removal guide. So that's another one that I would recommend for tips on controlling invasives in your yard. And does anyone have any questions about that? You can ask in the chat and we'll 
try to give you a good answer. Thank you. We've not received any questions in the chat yet, except for what are the dates of the City Nature Challenge? And I was able to respond in the chat April 30th through May 3rd. And I think there'll be more information about that uh, towards the end. Well, Jake was our last presenter of the evening. So I would like to open it up for um, all of our uh, presenters to come off mute. Um, and if you want to type in a question, or if you feel so inclined, you can also unmute yourself and uh, just directly ask us. We have a lot of really smart people here who know a lot about nature and uh, different ways to engage doing citizen science. So we do have a question from Julie. Uh, I have winter creeper taking over a large area of our woods. What do you suggest to get rid of it, pulling or covering? Well, I would just say, depending on the extent of the infestation, uh, it could require professional restoration to really get it under control. If you have a large property, winter creeper is notoriously difficult to, to kill because uh, the leaves have a waxy cuticle. So our ecological restoration contractors use uh, methylated seed oil that penetrates the wax and uh, cuticle on the, the leaf so the herbicide can be absorbed. Uh, and they usually use a chemical called triclopyr for that. However, if it's a smaller infestation, you can use just a hand pulling. The most important thing is to keep the climbing vines off of the trees because that's when they can fruit and the spread spread seed. So if you just keep it confined to the ground, then it uh, isn't likely to reproduce. But hand pulling is very difficult. It sends out long runners. It forms like a thick mat of vegetation, uh, but uh, you can pull it up that way. If you cover it, to smother it, um, you can use something like tarp or um, black um, landscaping fabric if you staple it in. However, you're also gonna kill off any of the native plant community that might exist there too. So if you have a really thick infestation and it's um, like mostly winter creeper, then that would be fine. And then after that, you'll have to go back in and reseed with uh, native plants. Uh, typically like grasses are going to establish the fastest and you could also use containerized trees and shrubs um, to keep it suppressed in the future or plant plugs of uh, wildflowers that are more shade tolerant because I assume it's a wooded section. Thanks, Jacob. Do we have any other questions? As Kelly mentioned, we can. Uh, you can go off of uh, your mute and ask directly or you can put them in the chat. Well, I wanted to um, just sort of piggyback on something that Jacob said about um, if you don't have a backyard or maybe you're just a little bored with your backyard and you want to get out to some other areas. We're um, at the Indiana Forest Alliance, we're also recruiting people to uh, help us assess some uh, privately owned forest as part of our forest for Indy project. And um, uh, we have to make sure we have permission. So please contact me if you're interested in doing that. And I believe you can also sign up through the form that was shared earlier, which, um, is that correct, Ray? Well, that is uh, for the EcoBlitz work, which is just a sort of extended BioBlitz in the state forest, but sure, yeah, maybe just oh. make a note if you're interested in working in Indianapolis instead of in the state forest. And one thing I do want to quickly highlight, um, as Brittany mentioned, we are doing a more Indianapolis focused um, kind of subset of this City Nature Challenge. And what that partly means is we will be giving out separate prizes for those in Indianapolis with the um, highest number of observations, um, the highest number of identification. Oh, well, it's like the I think you call it identification. Is that correct, Brittany? Because uh, you know the category is better than me. You should maybe jump in here. <laughs> it's the same categories as City Nature Challenge. We're just um, also separately pulling out Indianapolis to help hopefully incentivize to get as many um, 
observations here in Indianapolis and Marion County. Yes, Kelly. So there are three categories. Um, the highest number of, of observations, so that is how I showed you to take the photo and upload the observation. Uh, also, the highest number of identifications, so that was uh, we showed that someone went in and confirmed the identification of my orchid species, and then also a prize for uh, the most diversity of species, so the most species observed. So three opportunities, and even if you're unable to get out in the field um, on your own, um, if you are shut in your home for some reason, you can still participate in the identifications without leaving uh, the comforts of your home. So I, I look forward to this time of year uh, every single year. The City Nature Challenge inspires me to get out and try to be competitive and to record as much as I can. Uh, so it really is a fun activity and fun event. So if you have any questions about that or how to participate, please reach out. Your enthusiasm is contagious. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ray. I'm just hoping to bring home a prize again this year. <laughs> And now I can double up because I can do the indie backyard bio blitz and city. <laughs> we might have to disqualify you from winning both or taking all prizes at least. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We yeah. we still enjoy it and it, it's fun. Um, another aspect of this is you can look up um, a certain species that you are looking for. So Jacob was talking about winter creeper. Uh, so I'm going to share this really quickly. Uh, so I went into iNaturalist on my desktop and I typed in winter creeper and there are almost 9,000 observations of that dang winter creeper. <laughs> so now I can even type in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana and let's see how many. Oh, zebra at the zoo. I didn't want the zoo. <laughs> I'm glad it hasn't gotten to the zoo yet. Uh, but anyways, you can look up um, all different species. You can type in the location. Um, it's a great way to track uh, the exotic invasive plants, uh, but also some of the more exciting things like uh, I'm going to type in bobcat in Indiana. See, I can have fun with this all day long. <laughs> How about armadillo? Did you know yeah, armadillos? Have armadillos in Indiana? But look at this for bobcats. I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah. So 86 people have reported a bobcat in Indiana with a photo of it. Um, so 344 observations. Uh, so it's really cool just to um, explore and see what people are uploading. Um, I could do that all day. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my <laughs> Well, that is also uh, an exciting thing. So maybe you wanted to see a certain board so you could look at that and think about what pox you might find, say, a Baltimore Oriole or whatever you might want to be finding, especially since we're in a migratory uh, time right now. So that's another way to use this is to kind of think about which park you want to visit kind of based on what other people have been able to see there. It's kind of like the app is replacing the teams of scientists that we've been hiring to go out in the forest and leave the leave the teams. It doesn't totally replace them, but it sure goes a long way towards replacing them. <laughs> It'll never replace people. Um, it does a wonderful job um, on plants and birds. Um, it still has a little bit to learn as far as uh, spiders, it doesn't do very well, and mushrooms, uh, quite a bit to be desired. But for plants, yes, uh, iNaturalist has got it down. So the more observations uh, that it receives, the better the uh, artificial intelligence becomes. But yeah, I agree with Jake. Still nothing beats a book, especially a local book uh, that will only show you what's in your area. Yeah, it's a great program. I, I really enjoy iNaturalist. And also to highlight something Jake was referencing before, I did quickly want to bring up the online version of the Backyard Bio Blitz. So uh, the link was shared. It's on our website. Um, this works also on your phone. But the nice thing is if I click on it, 
it's actually going to add a check mark. So as I find the different items, it is going to help you record that and remember. So if I saw cardinals, I can click on it. You know, if I see some bluebells, and then if you realize maybe you use iNaturalist to confirm what you identified and it's not actually a bluebell, you can just unclick it. So um, it is a really good um, interactive way, especially if you don't have a printer or just want to save a tree and not print something out. So I just wanted to show that real fast. And I guess if we, we can also end early if we don't have any uh, additional questions, but it looks like Ray wants to say something. I, I want to ask a question. Um, when there's been this mention of winter creeper several times. So if you have a property that is infested with winter creeper or bush honeysuckle or whatever invasive species, um, is there funding to help you um, restore it? Is there any sort of assistance? I feel like Jacob might be For the private one. landowners. So we can certainly assist with uh, like technical advice, provide recommendations for control, um, but I, there may be funds, like if you have some acreage or a larger property through DNR, Wildlife Habitat Improvement Program, some of that can go toward uh, invasive species removal and control, but um, we can um, try to look into some other resources that might be able to assist with that. Um, but the, the problem, of course, with invasive species is just that they outcompete the native plant community and um, they spread aggressively. And then before long, if you let it go and it's not managed, then it's going to just become a monoculture of like one or two species that dominate the landscape. And they also degrade um, uh, the habitat value, not only for wildlife, it can contribute to, you know, increased runoff and erosion. So they, they have, you know, really you know, big problems in our, our local uh, native, you know, habitat. So hopefully this is something you're already aware of and you're um, interested in, in learning more about, but, you know, we're, we're up to over 70 different species of invasive plants that are currently managed just in Indy Parks properties. I keep thinking about trying to find a Boy Scout troop to come to my property, get a badge. Yeah, green. yeah. Some are definitely easier to control than others too. Winter creeper is one of the more challenging, but you know, bush honeysuckle, if it's small, you can pull it. Um, you can also cut it off and uh, treat the stump so it doesn't re-sprout. Uh, garlic mustard is one that's blooming right now. If you've seen that in like a wooded setting, you want to pull that and bag it because it can produce a lot of seeds that will remain viable in the soil. You'll be, you know, finding it in the same spot for many years if you don't get rid of it. And um, even then you're like expected to do um, long-term management just to keep it under control. So Lisa wants to know if any of uh, the groups represented here will be at the Earth Day Festival um, on June 5th. Yeah, Oh, great question. Uh, yes, Indy Parks usually has a presence, uh, whether it is Indy Park um, staff or employees or some of our friends groups associated with Indy Park. So yeah, we, we participate every single year. And as of right now, Roe uh, is not planning to be there simply because our um, COVID guidance hasn't allowed it, but I saw the CDC came out with some new guidance today about outdoor events. So we may be able to change that in the near future. Yeah, the Indiana Forest Alliance is usually at the Earth Day, but I don't know if uh, if, if we're going to do it this year um, because of COVID. I'm just not sure if the decision has been made yet. Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, yeah, any final questions, feel free to just come off mute. Um, a few things, yeah, obviously please participate in the City Nature Challenge that's going on this very weekend. Um, and as Brittany said, you don't even actually really have to opt in. It will automatically count you to it as long as you start using your iNaturalist. So download iNaturalist now and use it this weekend. Um, 
this uh, City Nature Challenge slash our own backyard bio blitz is just one opportunity um, to do some citizen science through Row. As uh, the COVID restrictions continue to roll back, we're all hoping to be able to do other ways to get people directly outside, getting their um, feet dirty, hands wet. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to start doing some Hoosier River Watch sampling, other um, in the field walk to help collect data and really evaluate the health of our waterways and communities. So keep uh, keep tuned for that. We will follow up as things continue to develop on that side of things. Um, in the meantime, also feel free to uh, follow us on Facebook, sign up for our newsletter or any of these wonderful organizations. Um, you have links um, in this and we will also be posting uh, the, this recording on our website and you will be able to access it for future reference. Thank you, everyone. Anyone have any last words? Kelly, would you mind telling them about the survey that we'd like for them to take? And I'm looking for that link right now to post that. Yes, I completely forgot about that. <laughs> and um, so we do have an event survey that will be coming on to our chat shortly. And that's just to help us evaluate uh, what you learned in this event, um, help us hopefully improve it a little bit. The exciting thing is if you do complete the survey and you want to provide your mailing address and name, we will mail you a native seed packet so that you can help uh, start planting native seeds in your own yard. So I will give it just a moment. So hopefully, um, there we go. It is up in the chat right now, so please go ahead and click on it. Um, I will leave this event open just a little bit longer, but I will stop recording at least. So um, if you want to chat and not be part of <laughs> the long-term recording, I am stopping it now.